The Wind in the Willows was written by Kenneth Graham, who was born in Scotland but brought up in a large house in Berkshire. As a boy, he loved to wander through the countryside and along the banks of the River Thames, which ran nearby. When he grew up, he worked as a secretary at the Bank of England, but he also wrote a number of books. He used to make up stories about life along the river bank for his young son, but had no intention of writing them down and publishing them until a friend persuaded him to. The Wind in the Willows was published in 1908 and has been a great favourite ever since, especially since 1929 when A. A. Milne turned it into a stage play called Toad of Toad Hall. The story begins, though, quite a long way from Toad Hall, under the ground. had been working very hard all the morning, spring cleaning his little home. First with brooms, then with dusters. Then on ladders and steps and chairs, with a brush and a pail of whitewash, until he had dust in his throat and eyes and splashes of whitewash all over his black fur and an aching back and weary arms. Spring was moving in the air above and in the earth below and around him, penetrating even his dark and lowly little house with its spirit of divine discontent and longing. It was small wonder, then, that he suddenly flung down his brush on the floor, said, Bother! and Oh! Blow! and also, Hang! Spring cleaning! and bolted out of the house without even waiting to put on his coat. Something up above was calling him imperiously and he made for the steep little tunnel, which answered, in his case, to the gravelled carriage drive owned by animals whose residences are nearer to the sun and air. So he scraped and scratched and scrabbled and scrooged, and then he scrooged again and scrabbled and scratched and scraped, working busily with his little paws, muttering to himself, Up we go! Up we go! Until at last, pop! His snout came out into the sunlight, and he found himself rolling in the warm grass of a great meadow. Oh, this is fine, he said to himself. This is better than whitewashing. The sunshine struck hot on his fur. Soft breezes caressed his heated brow. And after the seclusion of the cellarage he'd lived in so long, the carol of happy birds fell on his dulled hearing almost like a shout jumping off all his four legs at once in the joy of living and the delight of spring without its cleaning, he pursued his way. It all seemed too good to be true. Hither and thither through the meadows he rambled busily, along the hedgerows, across the copses, finding everywhere birds building, flowers budding, leaves thrusting, everything happy and progressive and occupied. And instead of having an uneasy conscience pricking him and whispering, Whitewash, he somehow could only feel how jolly it was to be the only idle dog among all these busy citizens. After all, the best part of a holiday is perhaps not so much to be resting yourself as to see all the other fellows busy working. He thought his happiness was complete when, as he meandered aimlessly along, suddenly... He stood by the edge of a full-fed river. Never in his life had he seen a river before. This sleek, sinuous, full-bodied animal, chasing and chuckling, gripping things with a gurgle and leaving them with a laugh, to fling itself on fresh playmates that shook themselves free and were caught and held again. All was a shake and a shiver, glints and gleams and sparkles, rustle and swirl, chatter and bubble. The mole was bewitched, entranced, fascinated. As he sat on the grass and looked across the river, a dark hole in the bank opposite, just above the water's edge, caught his eye. 
and dreamily he fell to considering what a nice snug dwelling place it would make for an animal with few wants and fond of a bijou riverside residence above flood level and remote from noise and dust as he gazed something bright and small seemed to twinkle down in the heart of it vanished then twinkled once more like a tiny star but it could hardly be a star in such an unlikely situation and it was too glittering and small for a glowworm then as he looked it winked at him and so declared itself to be an eye and a small face began gradually to grow up round it like a frame round a picture a brown little face with whiskers a grave round face with the same twinkle in its eye that had first attracted his notice small neat ears and thick silky hair it was the water rat <laughs> Two animals stood and regarded each other cautiously. Hello, Mole, said the water rat. Hello, rat, said the Mole. Would you like to come over? inquired the rat presently. Oh, it's all very well to talk, said the Mole rather pettishly, he being new to a river and riverside life and its ways. The rat said nothing but stooped and unfastened a rope and hauled on it, then lightly stepped into a little boat which the mole had not observed. It was painted blue outside and white within, and was just the size for two animals, and the mole's whole heart went out to it at once, even though he did not yet fully understand its uses. The rat sculled smartly across and made fast. Then he held up his forepaw as the mole stepped gingerly down. Lean on that, he said. Now then, step lively. And the mole, to his surprise and rapture, found himself actually seated in the stern of a real boat. Oh, this has been a wonderful day, said he, as the rat shoved off and took to the skulls again. Do you know, I've never been in a boat before in all my life. What? cried the rat, open-mouthed. Never been in a... You never... Well, I... <laughs> what have you been doing, then? I is it so nice as all that? asked the Mole shyly, although he was quite prepared to believe it as he leant back in his seat and surveyed the cushions, the oars, the rollocks, and all the fascinating fittings, and felt the boat sway lightly under him. Nice? It's the only thing, said the Water Rat solemnly, as he leant forward for his stroke. Believe me, my young friend, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, half so much worth doing as simply messing about in boats. Simply messing, he went on dreamily, messing about in boats. Messing! Uh, look ahead, rat! cried the mole suddenly. It was too late. The boat struck the bank full tilt. The dreamer, the joyous oarsman, lay on his back at the bottom of the boat, his heels in the air. About in boats, or with boats, the rat went on composedly, picking himself up with a pleasant laugh. <laughs> in them or out of them, it doesn't matter. Nothing seems really to matter, that's the charm of it. Whether you get away, or whether you don't. Whether you arrive at your destination, or whether you reach somewhere else. Or whether you never get anywhere at all. You're always busy. And you never do anything in particular. And when you've done it, there's always something else to do. And you can do it if you like. <laughs> but you'd much better not. Look here. If you've really nothing else on hand this morning, supposing we drop down the river together and have a long day of it. The mole waggled his toes from sheer happiness, spread his chest with a sigh of full contentment, and leaned back blissfully into the soft cushions. Oh, what a day I'm having, he said. Let's start at once. No, no, hold hard a minute then, said the rat. He looped the painter through a ring in his landing stage, 
climbed up into his hole above, and after a short interval reappeared staggering under a fat wicker luncheon basket. Shove that under your feet, he observed to the mole as he passed it down into the boat. Then he untied the painter and took the skulls again. What's inside it? asked the mole, wriggling with curiosity. Uh, <clears throat> there's cold chicken inside it, replied the rat briefly. Cold tongue, cold ham, cold beef, pickled gherkins, salad, french rolls, quest sandwich, potted meat, ginger beer, lemonade, soda water. Oh, oh, stop, stop, cried the mole in ecstasy. This is too much. Do you really think so? inquired the rat seriously. It's only what I always take on these little excursions, and the other animals are always telling me that I'm a mean beast and cut it very fine. The mole never heard a word he was saying. Absorbed in the new life he was entering upon, intoxicated with the sparkle, the ripple, the scents and the sounds and the sunlight, he trailed a paw in the water and dreamed long waking dreams. The water rat, like the good little fellow he was, sculled steadily on and forbore to disturb him. What lies over there? asked the mole, waving a paw towards a background of woodland that darkly framed the water meadows on one side of the river. That? Oh, uh, <clears throat> that's just the wild wood, said the rat shortly. We don't go there very much, we river bankers. Oh, uh, aren't they, aren't they very nice people in there? said the mole a trifle nervously. Well, replied the rat, uh, let me see. Uh, well, the squirrels are all right, uh, and the rabbits, some of them, but uh, rabbits are a mixed lot. And then there's Badger, of course. He lives right in the heart of it. Wouldn't live anywhere else either if you paid him to do it. Ah, dear old Badger. Nobody interferes with him. They'd better not, he added significantly. Why, who should interfere with him? asked the Mole. Well, of course, um, there, there are others explained the rat in a hesitating sort of way. Weasels and stoats and uh, foxes and so on. Oh, they're all right in a way. I'm very good friends with them. Past the time of day when we meet and all that, but uh, they break out sometimes. There's no denying it. And then, well, you, you can't really trust them. That's the fact. The mole knew quite well that it was quite against animal etiquette to dwell on possible trouble ahead, or even to allude to it. So he dropped the subject. And beyond the wild wood again, he asked, eh, where, where it's all blue and dim, and one sees what may be hills, or, or perhaps they mayn't, and eh, something like the smoke of towns, or is it only cloud drift? Beyond the wild wood comes the wide world, said the rat. And that's something that doesn't matter, either to you or me. I've never been there, and I'm never going. Nor you either, if you've got any sense at all. But don't ever refer to it again, please. Now then, here's our backwater at last, where we're going to lunch. The rat brought the boat alongside the bank, made her fast, helped the still awkward mole ashore, and swung out the luncheon basket. The mole begged as a favour to be allowed to unpack it all by himself. And the rat was very pleased to indulge him, and to sprawl at full length on the grass and rest, while his excited friend shook out the tablecloth and spread it, took out all the mysterious packets one by one, and arranged their contents in due order, still gasping, Oh my, oh my, at each fresh revelation. When all was ready, the rat said, Now, pitch in, old fellow. And the mole was indeed very glad to obey, for he'd started his spring cleaning at a very early hour that morning, as people will do, and had not paused for bite or sup. And he'd been through a very great deal since that distant time, which now seemed so many days ago. What are you looking at? said the rat presently, when the edge of their hunger was somewhat dulled, and the mole's eyes were able to wander off the tablecloth a little. 
I am looking, said the Mole, at a streak of bubbles that I see travelling along the surface of the water. That is a thing that strikes me as funny. Bubbles? Oh, ho, ho, said the Rat, and chirruped cheerily in an inviting sort of way. A broad, glistening muzzle showed itself above the edge of the bank, and the otter hauled himself out and shook the water from his coat. Oh, greedy beggars, he observed, making for the provender. Why didn't you invite me, Ratty? Oh, this was an impromptu affair, explained the Rat. Oh, by the way, uh, my friend, Mr. Mole. Proud, I'm sure, said the otter, and the two animals were friends forthwith. Such a rumpus everywhere, continued the otter. All the world seems to be out on the river today. I came up this backwater to try and get a moment's peace, and then stumble upon you fellows. Oh, at least, uh, I beg your pardon, <laughs> I don't exactly mean that, you know. There was a rustle behind them, proceeding from a hedge where last year's leaves still clung thick, and a stripy head with high shoulders behind it peered forth on them. Come on, old badger, shouted the rat. The badger trotted forward a pace or two, then grunted, eh, Company, and turned his back and disappeared from view. Ah, oh, that's just the sort of fellow he is, observed the disappointed rat. Simply hates society. Now we shan't see any more of him today. Well, tell us who's out on the river. Toad's out, for one, replied the otter, in his brand new wager boat. New togs, new everything. The two animals looked at each other and laughed. <laughs> Once it was nothing but sailing, said the rat. Then he tired of that and took to punting. Nothing would please him but to punt all day and every day, and a nice mess he made of it. Last year it was houseboating. We all had to go and stay with him in his houseboat and pretend we liked it. He was going to spend the rest of his life in a houseboat. It's all the same. Whatever he takes up, he gets tired of it and starts on something fresh. Such a good fellow, too, remarked the otter reflectively. But no stability, especially in a boat. From where they sat, they could get a glimpse of the main stream across the island that separated them. And just then, a wager boat flashed into view. The rower, a short, stout figure, splashing badly and rolling a good deal, but working his hardest. The rat stood up and hailed him, but Toad, for it was he, shook his head and settled sternly to his work. You'll be out of the boat in a minute if he rolls like that, said the rat, sitting down again. <laughs> of course he will, chuckled the otter. Did I ever tell you the good story about Toad and the lock keeper? It happened this way. Toad! An errant mayfly swerved unsteadily athwart the current in the intoxicated fashion affected by young bloods of mayflies seeing life. A swirl of water and a... <laughs> and the mayfly was visible no more. Neither was the otter. The mole looked down. The voice was still in his ears. But the turf whereon he had sprawled was clearly vacant. Not an otter to be seen as far as the distant horizon. But again there was a streak of bubbles on the surface of the river. The rat hummed a tune and the mole recollected that animal etiquette forbade any sort of comment on the sudden disappearance of one's friends at any moment, for any reason or no reason whatever. Well, well, said the rat, I suppose we ought to be moving. I wonder which of us had better pack the luncheon basket. He did not speak as if he was frightfully eager for the treat. Oh, please, let me, said the mole. So, of course... The rat let him. When they got home, the rat made a bright fire in the parlour and planted the mole in an armchair in front of it, having fetched down a dressing gown and slippers for him, and told him river stories till supper time. Very thrilling stories they were, too, to an earth dwelling animal like Mole. Stories about weirs and sudden floods and leaping pike and steamers that flung hard bottles. At least bottles were certainly flung, and from steamers, so presumably by them. And about herons, and how particular they were whom they spoke to, and about adventures down drains, and night fishings with otter, or excursions far afield with badger. 
supper was a most cheerful meal. But very shortly afterwards, a terribly sleepy mole had to be escorted upstairs by his considerate host to the best bedroom, where he soon laid his head on the pillow in great peace and contentment, knowing that his newfound friend the river was lapping the sill of his window. This day was only the first of many similar ones for the emancipated mole, each of them longer and fuller of interest as the ripening summer moved onward. He learned to swim and to row and entered into the joy of running water. And with his ear to the reed stems, he caught at intervals something of what the wind went whispering so constantly among them. Toad Hall, said the rat, and that creek on the left, where the notice board says, private, no landing allowed, leads to Toad's Boathouse, where we'll leave the boat. The stables are over there to the right. Uh, that's the banqueting hall you're looking at now. Very old, that is. Toad is rather rich, you know, and this is really one of the nicest houses in these parts, although we never admit as much to Toad. They glided up the creek, and the mole shipped his skulls as they passed into the shadow of a large boathouse. Here they saw many handsome boats, slung from the crossbeams or hauled up on a slip, but none in the water. The place had an unused and deserted air. The rat looked around him. I understand, said he. Boating is played out. He's tired of it and done with it. I wonder what new fad he's taken up now. Come along, let's look him up. We shall hear all about it quite soon enough. They disembarked and strolled across the gay flower-decked lawns in search of Toad, whom they presently happened upon resting in a wicker garden chair with a preoccupied expression of face and a large map spread out on his knees. Hooray! he cried, jumping up on seeing them. It is splendid! He shook the paws of both of them warmly, never waiting for an introduction to the mole. How kind of you, he went on, dancing round them. I was just going to send a boat down the river for you, Ratty, with strict orders that you were to be fetched up here at once, whatever you were doing. I want you badly, uh, both of you. Now, what'll you take, huh? Come inside and have something. <laughs> you don't know how lucky it is you're turning up just now. Uh, let's sit quiet a bit, Toady, said the Rat, throwing himself into an easy chair, while the Mole took another by the side of him and made some civil remark about Toad's delightful residence. Finest house on the whole river, cried Toad boisterously. Or anywhere else, for that matter, he couldn't help adding. Here the Rat nudged the Mole. Unfortunately, the Toad saw him do it and turned very red. There was a moment's painful silence. Then Toad burst out laughing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ratty, he said. Yeah, it's only my way, you know. And it's not such a very bad house, is it? You know, you rather like it yourself. Now, now look here. Let's be sensible. You are the very animals I wanted. You've got to help me. It's, it's most important. It's uh, about your rowing, I suppose, said the Rat with an innocent air. They are um, getting on fairly well, although you splash a good bit still. With a great deal of patience and any quantity of coaching, you may... Oh, pool boating interrupted the toad in great disgust. Silly boyish amusement. I've given that up long ago. Sheer waste of time, that's what it is. Makes me downright sorry to see you fellows who ought to know better spending all your energies in that aimless manner. No, 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 I've discovered the real thing, the only genuine occupation for a lifetime. I propose to devote the remainder of my life to it, and can only regret the wasted years that lie behind me squandered in trivialities. Come with me, dear Ratty, and your amiable friend also, if you'll be so very good, just as far as the stable yard, and you shall see what you shall see. He led the way to the stable yard accordingly, the Rat following with a most mistrustful expression. And there, drawn out of the coach house into the open, they saw a gypsy caravan, shining with newness, 
painted a canary yellow picked out with green and red wheels. There you are, cried the toad, straddling and expanding himself. There's real life for you, embodied in that little cart. The open road, the dusty highway, the heath, the common, the hedgerows, the rolling downs. Camps, villages, towns, cities, here today, up and off to somewhere else tomorrow. Travel, change, interest, excitement. The whole world before you, and a horizon that's always changing. And mind, this is the very finest cart of its sort that was ever built, without any exception. Come inside and look at the arrangements. Ah, planned them all myself, I did. The mole was tremendously interested and excited, and followed him eagerly up the steps and into the interior of the caravan. The rat only snorted and thrust his hands deep into his pockets, remaining where he was. It was indeed very compact and comfortable. Little sleeping bunks, a little table that folded up against the wall, a cooking stove, lockers, bookshelves, a bird cage with a bird in it, and pots, pans, jugs and kettles of every size and variety. All complete, said the toad triumphantly, pulling open a locker. You see? Biscuits, potted lobster, sardines, everything you can possibly want. Soda water here, backy there. Letter paper, bacon, jam, cards, and dominoes. You'll find, he continued as they descended the steps again, you'll find that nothing whatever has been forgotten when we make our start this afternoon. I beg your pardon, said the rat slowly as he chewed a straw. But did I overhear you say something about we and start and this afternoon? Now, you dear good old ratty, said Toad imploringly, don't begin talking in that stiff and sniffy sort of way, because, you, you know, you, you've got to come. I can't possibly manage without you, so please consider it settled. And don't argue, it's the one thing I can't stand. You surely don't mean to stick to your dull, fusty old river all your life and just live in a hole in a bank and boat. I want to show you the world. I'm going to make an animal of you, my boy. When they were quite ready, the now triumphant Toad led his companions to the paddock and set them to capture the old grey horse, who, without having been consulted, and to his own extreme annoyance, had been told off by Toad for the dustiest job in this dusty expedition. He, frankly, preferred the paddock and took a deal of catching. Meantime, Toad packed the lockers still tighter with necessaries and hung nose bags, nets of onions, bundles of hay and baskets from the bottom of the cart. At last the horse was caught and harnessed, and they set off, all talking at once, each animal either trudging by the side of the cart or sitting on the shaft as the humour took him. It was a golden afternoon. The smell of the dust they kicked up was rich and satisfying. Out of thick orchards on either side of the road, birds called and whistled to them cheerily. Good-natured wayfarers passing them gave them good day, or stopped to say nice things about their beautiful cart. Late in the evening, tired and happy and miles from home, they drew up on a remote common, far from habitations, turned the horse loose to graze, and ate their simple supper sitting on the grass by the side of the cart. Toad talked big about all he was going to do in the days to come, while stars grew fuller and larger all around them, and a yellow moon, appearing suddenly and silently from nowhere in particular, came to keep them company and listen to their talk. At last, they turned into their little bunks in the cart, and Toad, kicking out his legs, sleepily said, Well, good night, you fellows. This is the real life for a gentleman. Talk about your old river. I don't talk about my river, replied the patient rat. You know I don't, Toad. But I... Think about it, he added pathetically in a lower tone. I think about it 
all the time. The mole reached out from under his blanket, felt for the rat's paw in the darkness, and gave it a squeeze. I'll do whatever you like, Ratty, he whispered. Shall we run away tomorrow morning quite early, very early, and go back to our dear old hole on the river? No, no, we'll see it out, whispered back the rat. Thanks awfully, but I ought to stick by Toad till this trip is ended. It wouldn't be safe for him to be left to himself. It won't take very long. His fads never do. Good night. The end was indeed nearer than even the rat suspected. <laughs> They were strolling along the high road easily, the mole by the horse's head, talking to him, since the horse had complained that he was being frightfully left out of it, and nobody considered him in the least. The toad and the water rat, walking behind the cart, talking together. At least, toad was talking, and rat was saying at intervals, uh, Yes, yes, precisely, and uh, what did you say to him? And thinking all the time of something very different when far behind them they heard a faint warning hum like the drone of a distant bee. Glancing back they saw a small cloud of dust with a dark centre of energy advancing on them at incredible speed, while from out of the dust a faint boop boop wailed like an uneasy animal in pain. Hardly regarding it they turned to resume their conversation when in an instant, as it seemed, the peaceful scene was changed, and with a blast of wind and a whirl of sound that made them jump for the nearest ditch, it was on them. The whoop whoop rang with a brazen shout in their ears. They had a moment's glimpse of an interior of glittering plate glass and rich Morocco, and the magnificent motor car, immense, breath-snatching, passionate with its pilot tense and hugging his wheel, possessed all earth and air for the fraction of a second, flung an enveloping cloud of dust that blinded and enwrapped them utterly, and then dwindled to a speck in the far distance, changed back into a droning bee once more. The old grey horse, dreaming as he plodded along of his quiet paddock, in a new, raw situation such as this, simply abandoned himself to his natural emotions, rearing, plunging, backing steadily, in spite of all the mole's efforts at his head and all the mole's language directed at his better feelings, he drove the cart backwards towards the deep ditch at the side of the road. It wavered an instant. Then there was a heart-rending crash, and the canary-coloured cart, their pride and their joy, lay on its side in the ditch, an irredeemable wreck. The rat danced up and down in the road, simply transported with passion. You villains! he shouted, shaking both fists. You scoundrel! You highwaymen! You, 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 you road hogs! I'll have the law on you! I'll report you! I'll take you through all the courts! Toad sat straight down in the middle of the dusty road, his legs stretched out before him, and stared fixedly in the direction of the disappearing motor car. He breathed short, his face wore a placid, satisfied expression, and at intervals he faintly murmured, Boop, boop. The mole was busy trying to quiet the horse, which he succeeded in doing after a time. Then he went to look at the cart on its side in the ditch. It was indeed a sorry sight. Panels and windows smashed, axles hopelessly bent, one wheel off, sardine tins scattered over the wide world, and the bird in the birdcage sobbing pitifully and calling to be let out. The rat came to help him, but their united efforts were not sufficient to right the cart. Hi, Toad! they cried. Come and bear a hand, can't you? The toad never answered a word or budged from his seat in the road. So they went to see what was the matter with him. They found him in a sort of trance, a happy smile on his face, his eyes still fixed on the dusty wake of their destroyer. At intervals he was still heard to murmur, 
the rat shook him by the shoulder. Are you coming to help us, Toad? he demanded sternly. Glorious, stirring sight, murmured Toad, never offering to move. The poetry of motion, the real way to travel, the only way to travel. Here today, in next week tomorrow. Villages skipped, towns and cities jumped, always somebody else's horizon. Oh, bliss, oh, poop, poop, oh my, oh my. Oh, stop being an ass, Toad, cried the Mole despairingly. And to think I never knew, went on the Toad in a dreamy monotone. All those wasted years that lie behind me, I never knew, never even dreamt. But now, oh, but now that I know, now that I fully realize, oh, what a flowery track lies spread before me henceforth. What dust clouds shall spring up behind me as I speed on my reckless way. What carts I shall fling carelessly into the ditch in the wake of my magnificent onset. Hurried little carts, common carts, canary-colored carts. What are we to do with him? asked the Mole of the Water Rat. Nothing at all, replied the Rat firmly, because there is really nothing to be done. You see, I know him of old. He is now possessed. He has got a new craze, and it always takes him that way in its first stage. He'll continue like that for days now, like an animal walking in a happy dream, quite useless for all practical purposes. Uh, never mind him. Let's go and see what there is to be done about the cart. A careful inspection showed them that even if they succeeded in writing it by themselves, the cart would travel no longer. The axles were in a hopeless state and the missing wheel was shattered into pieces. The rat knotted the horse's reins over his back and took him by the head, carrying the bird cage and its hysterical occupant in the other hand. Come on, he said grimly to the mole. It's five or six miles to the nearest town, and we shall just have to walk it. The sooner we make a start, the better. But, but, but what about Toad? asked the Mole anxiously as they set off together. Well, we can't leave him here, sitting in the middle of the road by himself, in the distracted state he's in. It's not safe. Supposing another thing were to come along. Oh, bother, Toad, said the Rat savagely. I've done with him. They had not proceeded very far on their way, however, when there was a pattering of feet behind them, and Toad caught them up and thrust a paw inside the elbow of each of them, still breathing short and staring into vacancy. Now look here, Toad, said the Rat sharply. As soon as we get to the town, you will have to go straight to the police station and see if they know anything about that motor car and who it belongs to, and lodge a complaint against it. And then you will have to go to a blacksmith's or a wheelwright's and arrange for the cart to be fetched and mended and put to rights. It'll take time, but it's not quite a hopeless smash. Meanwhile, the Mole and I will go to an inn and find comfortable rooms where we can stay till the cart's ready, until your nerves have recovered their shock. Police station? Complaint? murmured Toad dreamily. Me? Complain? Of that beautiful, that heavenly vision that has been vouchsafed me? Mend the cart? Oh, I've done with carts forever. I never want to see the cart or hear of it again. Oh, Ratty, you can't think how obliged I am to you for consenting to come on this trip. I wouldn't have gone without you, and then I might never have seen that... that swan, that sunbeam, that thunderbolt. I might never have heard that entrancing sound or smelt that bewitching smell. I owe it all to you, my best of friends. The rat turned from him in despair. You see what it is, he said to the mole, addressing him across Toad's head. It's quite hopeless. I give it up. When we get to the town, we'll go to the railway station, and with luck we may pick up a train there that'll get us back to Riverbank tonight. 
And if you ever catch me going a-pleasuring with this provoking animal again... <clears throat> he snorted, and during the rest of that weary trudge addressed his remarks exclusively to Mole. On reaching the town, they went straight to the station and deposited Toad in the second-class waiting room, giving a porter tuppence to keep a strict eye on him. They then left the horse at an inn stable and gave what directions they could about the cart and its contents. Eventually, a slow train, having landed them at a station not very far from Toad Hall, they escorted the spellbound, sleepwalking Toad to his door, put him inside it, and instructed his housekeeper to feed him, undress him, and put him to bed. Then they got out their boat from the boathouse, sculled down the river home, and at a very late hour sat down to supper in their own cosy riverside parlour, to the rat's great joy and contentment. The following evening, the Mole, who had risen late and taken things very easy all day, was sitting on the bank fishing, when the Rat, who had been looking up his friends and gossiping, came strolling along to find him. Heard the news, he said. There's nothing else being talked about all along the river bank. Toad went up to town by an early train this morning, and he has ordered a large and very expensive motor car. <laughs> Toad is, of course, a terrible driver. He has many crashes, injures himself several times, and gets into serious trouble with the police. When spring comes, Badger decides that it's time to cure Toad of his craze for fast motoring. He collects Mole and Rat to help him, and off they go. They reached the carriage drive of Toad Hall to find, as the Badger had anticipated, a shiny new motor car of great size, painted a bright red, Toad's favourite colour, standing in front of the house. As they neared the door, it was flung open, and Mr. Toad, arrayed in goggles, cap, gaiters, and enormous overcoat, came swaggering down the steps, drawing on his gauntleted gloves. <laughs> hello, hello! Come on, you fellows! he cried cheerfully on catching sight of them. You're just in time to come with me for a jolly... Uh, 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 to, to come for a jolly... Uh, uh, for, for, for a, jo a jolly... Uh... His hearty accents faltered and fell away as he noticed the stern, unbending look on the countenances of his silent friends, and his invitation remained unfinished. The badger strode up the steps. Take him inside, he said sternly to his companions. Then, as Toad was hustled through the door, struggling and protesting, he turned to the chauffeur in charge of the new motor car. I am afraid you won't be wanted today, he said. Mr. Toad has changed his mind. He will not require the car. Please understand that this is final. You needn't wait. Then he followed the others inside and shut the door. Now then, he said to the Toad, when the four of them stood together in the hall. First of all, take those ridiculous things off. Shan't, replied Toad with great spirit. What is the meaning of this gross outrage? I demand an instant explanation. Take them off him, then, you two, ordered the Badger briefly. They had to lay Toad out on the floor, kicking and calling all sorts of names, before they could get to work properly. Then the Rat sat on him, and the Mole got his motor clothes off him bit by bit, and they stood him up on his legs again. 
Now that he was merely towed, and no longer the terror of the highway, he giggled feebly and looked from one to the other appealingly, seeming quite to understand the situation. You knew it must come to this sooner or later, Toad, the Badger explained severely. You've disregarded all the warnings we've given you. You've gone on squandering the money your father left you. And you're getting us animals a bad name in the district by your furious driving and your smashes and your rows with the police. Independence is all very well. But we animals never allow our friends to make fools of themselves beyond a certain limit. And that limit you've reached. Now, you're a good fellow in many respects, and I don't want to be too hard on you. I'll make one more effort to bring you to reason. You will come with me into the smoking room. There you will hear some facts about yourself. And we'll see whether you come out of that room the same toad that you went in. He took Toad firmly by the arm, led him into the smoking room, and closed the door behind them. Oh, that's no good, said the Rat contemptuously. Talking to Toad will never cure him. He'll say anything. They made themselves comfortable in armchairs and waited patiently. Through the closed door, they could just hear the long, continuous drone of the badger's voice rising and falling in waves of oratory, and presently they noticed that the sermon began to be punctuated at intervals by long-drawn sobs, evidently proceeding from the bosom of Toad, who was a soft-hearted and affectionate fellow, very easily converted, uh, for the time being, to any point of view. After some three-quarters of an hour, the door opened, and the badger reappeared, solemnly leading by the paw a very limp and dejected toad. His skin hung baggily about him, his legs wobbled, and his cheeks were furrowed by the tears so plentifully called forth by the badger's moving discourse. Sit down there, toad, said the badger kindly, pointing to a chair. My friends, he went on, I am pleased to inform you that Toad has at last seen the error of his ways. He is truly sorry for his misguided conduct in the past, and has undertaken to give up motor cars entirely and forever. I have his solemn promise to that effect. Oh, that is very good news, said the Mole gravely. Yes, very good news indeed, observed the Rat dubiously. If only, if only, he was looking very hard at Toad as he said this, and could not help thinking he perceived something vaguely resembling a twinkle in that animal's still sorrowful eye. If there's only one more thing to be done, continued the gratified Badger. Toad! I want you solemnly to repeat before your friends here what you fully admitted to me in the smoking room just now. First, you are sorry for what you've done, and you see the folly of it all. There was a long, long pause. Toad looked desperately this way and that while the other animals waited in grave silence. At last he spoke. No, he said, a little sullenly but stoutly. I'm not sorry. And it wasn't folly at all. It was simply glorious. What? cried the badger, greatly scandalized. You backsliding animal, didn't you tell me just now, in there? Oh, yes, 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 in there, said Toad impatiently. I'd have said anything in there. Oh, you're so eloquent, dear Badger, and so moving, and so convincing, and put all your points so frightfully well. You can do what you like with me in there, and you know it. But I've been searching my mind since, and going over things in it, and I find that I'm not a bit sorry or repentant, really, so it's no earthly good saying I am, now is it? Then you don't promise, said the Badger, never to touch a motor car again? Certainly not replied Toad emphatically. On the contrary, I faithfully promise that the very first motor car I see 
Boop, boop, off I go in it. Told you so, didn't I, observed the rat to the mole. Very well, then, said the badger firmly, rising to his feet. Since you won't yield to persuasion, we'll try what force can do. I feared it would come to this all along. Now you have often asked us three to come and stay with you, Toad, in this handsome house of yours. Well, now we're going to. When we've converted you to a proper point of view, we may quit, but not before. Take him upstairs, you two, and lock him up in his bedroom while we arrange matters between ourselves. Each animal took it in turns to sleep in Toad's room at night, and they divided the day up between them. At first, Toad was undoubtedly very trying to his careful guardians. When his violent paroxysms possessed him, he would arrange bedroom chairs in rude resemblance of a motor car, and would crouch on the foremost of them, bent forward and staring fixedly ahead, making uncouth and ghastly noises till the climax was reached, when, turning a complete somersault, he would lie prostrate amidst the ruins of the chairs, apparently completely satisfied for the moment. As time passed, however, these painful seizures grew gradually less frequent, and his friends strove to divert his mind into fresh channels. But his interest in other matters did not seem to revive, and he grew apparently languid and depressed. One fine morning, the rat, whose turn it was to go on duty, went upstairs to relieve Badger, whom he found fidgeting to be off and stretch his legs in a long ramble round his wood and down his earths and burrows. Uh, Toad is still in bed, he told the rat outside the door. Can't get much out of him except, oh, leave him alone, he wants nothing, perhaps he'll be better presently, it may pass off in time, don't be unduly anxious, uh, and so on. Now, you you look out, Rat. When Toad's quiet and submissive, and playing at being the hero of a Sunday school prize, then he's at his artfulest. There's sure to be something up. I know him. Yes, well, uh, now I must be off. How are you today, old chap? inquired the Rat cheerfully as he approached Toad's bedside. He had to wait some minutes for an answer. At last, a feeble voice replied, Thank you so much, dear Ratty, so good of you to inquire. But first, tell me, how are you yourself and the excellent Mole? Oh, we're all right, replied the Rat. Mole, he added incautiously, is um, going out for a run round with Badger. They'll be out till luncheon time. So you and I will spend a pleasant morning together and I'll do my best to amuse you. Now, now, jump up, there's a good fellow, and don't lie moping there on a fine morning like this. Dear kind rat, murmured Toad, how little you realise my condition, and how very far I am from jumping up now, if ever. But do not trouble about me. I, I hate being a burden to my friends, and I do not expect to be one much longer. Indeed, I almost hope not. Yes, well, I hope not, too, said the Rat heartily. Oh, you've been a fine bother to us all this time, and I'm glad to hear it's going to stop. I end in weather like this, and the boating season just beginning. Oh, it's too bad of you, Toad. It isn't the trouble we mind, but you're making us miss such an awful lot. I'm afraid it is the trouble you mind, though, replied the Toad languidly. I can quite understand it natural enough. You're tired of bothering about me. I mustn't ask you to do anything further. I'm a nuisance, I know. <laughs> you are indeed, said the Rat. But I tell you, I'd take any trouble on earth for you, if only you'd be a sensible animal. If I thought that, Ratty, murmured Toad, more feebly than ever, 
then I would beg you, for the last time probably, to step round to the village as quickly as possible, even now it may be too late, and fetch the doctor. Uh, but don't you bother, it's only a trouble, and perhaps we may as well let things take their course. Now look here, old man, said the rat, beginning to get rather alarmed. Uh, uh, a doctor to you, if you really think you want him, but uh, you can hardly be bad enough for that yet. So let's talk about something else. Uh, I fear, dear friend, said Toad with a sad smile, that talk can do little in a case like this. <laughs> or doctors either, for that matter. Still, one must grasp at the slightest straw. And, uh, by the way, while you are about it, I hate to give you additional trouble, but I happen to remember that you will pass the door. Would you mind at the same time asking the lawyer to step up? It would be a convenience to me, and there are moments, or perhaps I should say there is a moment, when one must face disagreeable tasks at whatever cost to exhaust its nature. A lawyer? Oh, he must be really bad, the affrighted rat said to himself, as he hurried from the room, and not forgetting, however, to lock the door carefully behind him. <laughs> The toad, who had hopped lightly out of bed as soon as he heard the key turned in the lock, watched Rat eagerly from the window till he disappeared down the carriage drive. Then, laughing heartily, he dressed as quickly as possible in the smartest suit he could lay hands on at the moment, filled his pockets with cash which he took from a small drawer on the dressing table, and next, knotting the sheets from his bed together and tying one end of the improvised rope round the central mullion of the handsome Tudor window, which formed such a feature of his bedroom, he scrambled out, slid lightly to the ground, and taking the opposite direction to the rat, marched off light-heartedly, whistling a merry tune. It was a gloomy luncheon for Rat, when the badger and the mole at length returned, and he had to face them at table with his pitiful and unconvincing story. The badger's caustic, not to say brutal, remarks may be imagined, and therefore passed over. But it was painful to the Rat that even the mole, though he took his friend's side as far as possible, could not help saying, Oh, you've been a bit of a duffer this time, Ratty. Toad, too, of all animals. But he, he did it awfully well, said the crestfallen rat. He did you awfully well, rejoined the badger hotly. Meanwhile, Toad, gay and irresponsible, was walking briskly along the high road some miles from home. Oh, smart piece of work, that, he remarked to himself, chuckling. Brain against brute force, and brain came out on the top as it's bound to do. Poor old ratty. Oh, my, won't he catch it when the badger gets back. A worthy fellow, ratty, of many good qualities, but very little intelligence and absolutely no education. I must take him in hand some day and see if I can make something of him. Filled full of conceited thoughts such as these, he strode along, his head in the air, until he reached a little town where the sign of the Red Lion, swinging across the road halfway down the main street, reminded him that he had not breakfasted that day, and that he was exceedingly hungry after his long walk. He marched into the inn, ordered the best luncheon that could be provided at so short a notice, and sat down to eat it in the coffee room. He was about halfway through his meal, when an only too familiar sound approaching down the street made him start and fall a-trembling all over. The boop-boop drew nearer and nearer. The car could be heard to turn into the inn-yard and come to a stop. And Toad 
had to hold on to the leg of the table in order to conceal his overmastering emotion. Presently the party entered the coffee room, hungry, talkative and gay, voluble on their experiences of the morning and the merits of the chariot that had brought them along so well. Toad listened eagerly, all ears for a time. At last he could stand it no longer. He slipped out of the room quietly, paid his bill at the bar, and as soon as he got outside, sauntered round quietly to the inn-yard. There cannot be any harm, he said to himself, in my only just of looking at it. The car stood in the middle of the yard, quite unattended, the stable helps and other hangers-on being all at their dinner. Toad walked slowly round it, inspecting, criticising, musing deeply. I wonder, he said to himself presently, I wonder if this sort of car starts easily. Next moment, hardly knowing how it came about, he found he had hold of the handle and was turning it. As the familiar sound broke forth, the old passion seized on Toad and completely mastered him, body and soul. As if in a dream, he found himself somehow seated in the driver's seat. As if in a dream, he pulled the lever and swung the car round the yard and out through the archway. And as if in a dream, all sense of right and wrong, all fear of obvious consequences, seemed temporarily suspended. He increased his pace, and as the car devoured the street and leapt forth onto the high road through the open country, he was only conscious that he was Toad once more, Toad at his best and highest, Toad the terror, the traffic queller, the lord of the lone trail, before whom all must give way or be smitten into nothingness and everlasting night. He chanted as he flew, and the car responded with sonorous drone. The miles were eaten up under him as he sped, he knew not whither, fulfilling his instincts, living his hour, reckless of what might come to him. To my mind, observed the chairman of the bench of magistrates cheerfully, the only difficulty that presents itself in this otherwise very clear case is how we can possibly make it sufficiently hot for the incorrigible rogue and hardened ruffian whom we see cowering in the dock before us. Now, let me see. Uh, he has been found guilty, on the clearest evidence, first, of stealing a valuable motor car, secondly, of driving to the public danger, and thirdly, of gross impertinence to the rural police. Mr. Clark, will you tell us, please, what is the very stiffest penalty we can impose for each of these offences, uh, without, of course, giving the prisoner the benefit of any doubt, because there isn't any. The clerk scratched his nose with his pen. Uh, well, some people would consider, he observed, that stealing the motor car was the worst offence, and so it is. But cheeking the police undoubtedly carries the severest penalty, and so it ought. Uh, supposing you were to say twelve months for the theft, which is mild, and three years for the furious driving, which is lenient, and fifteen years for the cheek, which is pretty bad sort of cheek, judging by what we've heard from the witness box, even if you only believe one-tenth part of what you heard, and I never believe more myself, uh, these figures, if added together correctly, tot up to nineteen years. First rate, said the chairman. Uh, so you'd better make it around twenty years and be on the safe side, concluded the clerk. An excellent suggestion, said the chairman approvingly. Prisoner, pull yourself together and try and stand up straight. Now, it's going to be twenty years for you this time, and mind, if you appear before us again, upon any charge whatever, we shall have to deal with you very seriously. Then the brutal minions of the law fell upon the hapless toad, loaded him with chains, and dragged him from the courthouse, shrieking, praying, protesting, across the marketplace, 
where the playful populace, always as severe upon detected crime as they are sympathetic and helpful when one is merely wanted, assailed him with jeers, carrots, and popular catchwords. Across the hollow-sounding drawbridge, below the spiky portcullis, under the frowning archway of the grim old castle, whose ancient towers soared high overhead. Past guardrooms full of grinning soldiery off duty, past sentries who coughed in a hurried and sarcastic way, because that is as much as a sentry on his post dare do to show his contempt and abhorrence of crime. Across courtyards, where mastiffs strained at their leash and poured the air to get at him. Past ancient warders, their halberds leant against the wall, dozing over a pasty and a flagon of brown ale. On and on, past the rack chamber and the thumbscrew room, till they reached the door of the grimmest dungeon that lay in the heart of the innermost keep. There at last they paused, where an ancient jailer sat fingering a bunch of mighty keys. Fords, Buddikins, said the sergeant of police, taking off his helmet and wiping his forehead. Rouse thee, old loon, and take over from us this vile toad, a criminal of deepest guilt and matchless artfulness and resource. Watch and ward him with all thy skill. And mark thee well, greybeard, should aught and to aught befall, thy old head shall answer for his, and a murrain on both of them. The jailer nodded grimly, laying his withered hand on the shoulder of the miserable toad. The rusty key creaked in the lock, the great door clanged behind them. And Toad was a helpless prisoner in the remotest dungeon of the best guarded keep of the stoutest castle in all the length and breadth of Merry England. Poor Toad is terribly unhappy in prison, but after a while the jailer's daughter takes pity on him and helps him to escape, disguised as a washerwoman. He has many adventures and finally, almost home, he falls into the river and is rescued by the water rat. At Rat's house he hears that Toad Hall has been taken over by the wicked creatures from the wild woods, the weasels and the ferrets. The four friends decide to recapture the house. Badger, their leader, knows a secret underground passage that leads right to the middle of the stately home. So they groped and shuffled along, with their ears pricked up and their paws on their pistols, till at last the badger said, We ought by now to be pretty nearly under the hall. Then suddenly they heard, far away as it might be, and yet apparently nearly over their heads, a confused murmur of sound, as if people were shouting and cheering and stamping on the floor and hammering on tables. The passage now began to slope upwards. They groped onward a little further, and then the noise broke out again, quite distinct this time, and very close above them. Hooray! 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 They heard and the stamping of little feet on the floor, and the clinking of glasses as little fists pounded on the table. What a time they're having, said the badger. Come on. They hurried along the passage till it came to a full stop, and they found themselves standing under the trap door that led up into the butler's pantry. Such a tremendous noise was going on in the banqueting hall that there was little danger of their being overheard. The badger said, now, boys, all together. And the four of them put their shoulders to the trapdoor and heaved it back. Hoisting each other up, they found themselves standing in the pantry, with only a door between them and the banqueting hall, where their enemies were carousing. The noise, as they emerged from the passage, was simply deafening. At last, as the cheering and hammering slowly subsided, a voice could be made out saying, Well... 
I do not propose to detain you much longer. Great applause. But before I resume my seat, renewed cheering, I should like to say one word about our kind host, Mr. Toad. We all know Toad. Great laughter. Good Toad, modest Toad, honest Toad. Shrieks of merriment. <sighs> Only just let me get at him, muttered Toad, grinding his teeth. Hold hard a minute, said the badger, restraining him with difficulty. Get ready, all of you. Let me sing you a little song, went on the voice, which I have composed on the subject of Toad. Prolonged applause. Then the chief weasel, for it was he, began in a high squeaky voice, Toad, he went a pleasuring gaily down the street. The badger drew himself up, took a firm grip of his stick with both paws, glanced round at his comrades, and cried, The hour is come, follow me, and flung the door wide open. My, what a squealing and a squeaking and a screeching filled the air. Well might the terrified weasels dive under the tables and spring madly up at the windows. Well might the ferrets rush wildly for the fireplace and get hopelessly jammed in the chimney. Well might tables and chairs be upset and glass and china be sent crashing on the floor in the panic of that terrible moment when the four heroes strode wrathfully into the room. The mighty badger, his whiskers bristling, his great cudgel whistling through the air, Mole, black and grim, brandishing his stick and shouting his awful war cry, A mole! A mole! Rat, desperate and determined, his belt bulging with weapons of every age and every variety. Toad, frenzied with excitement and injured pride, swollen to twice his ordinary size, leaping into the air and emitting toad whoops that chilled him to the marrow. Toad, he went a-pleasuring, he yelled. I'll pleasure him! and he went straight for the chief weasel. They were but four in all, but to the panic-stricken weasels the hall seemed full of monstrous animals, grey, black, brown and yellow, whooping and flourishing enormous cudgels. And they broke and fled with squeals of terror and dismay, this way and that, through the windows, up the chimney, anywhere to get out of reach of those terrible sticks. The following morning, Toad, who had overslept himself, as usual, came down to breakfast disgracefully late, and found on the table a certain quantity of eggshells, some fragments of cold and leathery toast, a coffee-pot three-fourths empty, and really very little else, which did not tend to improve his temper, considering that after all it was his own house. Through the French windows of the breakfast-room, he could see the mole and the water rat sitting in wicker chairs out on the lawn, evidently telling each other stories, roaring with laughter and kicking their short legs up in the air. The badger, who was in an armchair and deep in the morning paper, merely looked up and nodded when Toad entered the room. But Toad knew his man, so he sat down and made the best breakfast he could, merely observing to himself that he would get square with the others sooner or later. When he'd nearly finished, the badger looked up and remarked rather shortly, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Toad, but I'm afraid there's a heavy morning's work in front of you. You see, we really ought to have a banquet at once to celebrate this affair. It's expected of you. In fact, it's the rule. Oh, all right, said the Toad readily. Anything to oblige. Though why on earth you should want to have a banquet in the morning, I cannot understand. <laughs> but you know, I do not live to please myself, but merely to find out what my friends want, and then try to arrange it for them, <laughs> you dear old badger. 
Don't pretend to be stupider than you really are, replied the badger crossly. And don't chuckle and splutter in your coffee while you're talking. It's not manners. What I mean is, the banquet will be at night, of course. But the invitations will have to be written and got off at once, and you've got to write them. Now, sit down at that table, the stacks of letter paper on it, with Toad Hall at the top in blue and gold, and write invitations to all our friends. And if you stick to it, we shall get them out before luncheon. And I'll bear a hand, too. Take my share of the burden. I'll order the banquet. What? cried Toad, dismayed. Me stop indoors and write a lot of rotten letters on a jolly morning like this when I want to go around my property and set everything and everybody to rights and swagger about and enjoy myself? Oh, certainly not. I'll be... I'll see you... Uh, 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 stop a minute, though. <laughs> Why, of course, dear Badra, uh, what is my pleasure or convenience compared with that of others? You wish it done, and it shall be done. Go, Badra, order the banquet, order what you like, then join our young friends outside in their innocent mirth, oblivious of me and my cares and toils. I sacrifice this fair morning on the altar of duty and friendship. The Badger looked at him very suspiciously, but Toad's frank, open countenance made it difficult to suggest any unworthy motive in this change of attitude. He quitted the room accordingly in the direction of the kitchen, and as soon as the door had closed behind him, Toad hurried to the writing table. A fine idea had occurred to him while he was talking. He would write the invitations, and he would take care to mention the leading part he had taken in the fight, and how he had laid the chief weasel flat and he would hint at his adventures, and what a career of triumph he had to tell about. And on the flyleaf he would give a, a sort of programme of entertainment for the evening, uh, uh, something like this, as he sketched it out in his head. Uh, speech by Toad. There will be other speeches by Toad during the evening. Address by Toad. Synopsis. Our prison system, the waterways of old England, property, its rights and its duties, back to the land, the typical English squire. Song by Toad, composed by himself. Other compositions by Toad it will be sung in the course of the evening by the composer. The idea pleased him mightily, and he worked very hard and got all the letters finished by noon. When the other animals came back to luncheon, very boisterous and breezy after morning on the river, the Mole, whose conscience had been pricking him, looked doubtfully at Toad, expecting to find him sulky or depressed. Instead, he was so uppish and inflated that the Mole began to suspect something, while the Rat and the Badger exchanged significant glances. As soon as the meal was over, Toad thrust his paws deep into his trouser pockets, remarked casually, Well, look after yourselves, you fellows. Ask for anything you want. And was swaggering off in the direction of the garden, where he wanted to think out an idea or two for his coming speeches, when the rat caught him by the arm. Toad rather suspected what he was after, and did his best to get away. But when the badger took him firmly by the other arm, he began to see that the game was up. The two animals conducted him between them into the small smoking room that opened out of the entrance hall, shut the door, and put him into a chair. Then they both stood in front of him, while Toad sat silent and regarded them with much suspicion and ill humour. Now, look here, Toad, said the Rat. It's about this banquet, and very sorry I am to have to speak to you like this. 
But we want you to understand clearly, once and for all, that there are going to be no speeches and no songs. Try and grasp the fact that on this occasion we're not arguing with you, we're just telling you. Toad saw that he was trapped. They understood him, they saw through him, they had got ahead of him. His pleasant dream was shattered. <sighs> Mayn't I sing them just one little song? he pleaded piteously. No, not one little song, replied the rat firmly, although his heart bled as he noticed the trembling lip of the poor disappointed toad. It's no good, Toady. You know well that your songs are all conceit and boasting and vanity, and your speeches are all self-praise and... and... well... and... and gross exaggeration and... and... And gas, put in the badger in his common way. It's for your own good, Toady, went on the rat. You know you must turn over a new leaf sooner or later, and now seems a splendid time to begin, a sort of turning point in your career. Now, please don't think that saying all this doesn't hurt me more than it hurts you. Toad remained a long while plunged in thought. At last he raised his head, and the traces of strong emotion were visible on his features. You have conquered, my friends, he said in broken accents. It was, to be sure, but a small thing that I asked. Merely leave to blossom and expand for yet one more evening, to let myself go and hear the tumultuous applause that always seems to me somehow to bring out my best qualities. However, you are right, I know, and I am wrong. Henceforth I will be a very different toad. My friends, you shall never have occasion to blush for me again. But, oh dear, oh dear, this is a hard world. At last the hour for the banquet began to draw near, and Toad went quietly down the stairs to greet his guests, who he knew must be assembling in the drawing room. All the animals cheered when he entered, and crowded round to congratulate him and say nice things about his courage and his cleverness and his fighting qualities. But Toad only smiled faintly and murmured, Not at all, or sometimes for a change, on the contrary. Otter, who was standing on the hearthrug, describing to an admiring circle of friends exactly how he would have managed things had he been there, came forward with a shout, threw his arm round Toad's neck, and tried to take him round the room in triumphal progress. But Toad, in a mild way, was rather snubby to him, remarking gently as he disengaged himself, Badger's was the mastermind. The mole and the water rat bore the brunt of the fighting, I merely served in the ranks and uh, did little or nothing. The animals were evidently puzzled and taken aback by this unexpected attitude of his, and Toad felt, as he moved from one guest to another, making his modest responses, that he was an object of absorbing interest to everyone. The badger had ordered everything of the best, and the banquet was a great success. There was much talking and laughter and chaff among the animals, but through it all Toad, who of course was in the chair, looked down his nose and murmured pleasant nothings to the animals on either side of him. At intervals he stole a glance at the badger and the rat, and always when he looked they were staring at each other with their mouths open, and this gave him the greatest satisfaction. Some of the younger and livelier animals, as the evening wore on, got whispering to each other that things were not so amusing as they used to be in the good old days, and there were some knockings on the table and cries of, Toad! Speech! Speech! From Toad! Song! Mr. Toad! Song! But Toad only shook his head gently, 
raised one paw in mild protest, and by pressing delicacies on his guests, by topical small talk, and by earnest inquiries after members of their families, not yet old enough to appear at social functions, managed to convey to them that this dinner was being run on strictly conventional lines. He was indeed an altered toad. Thank you.